Welcome to the Stronger Than Steel podcast with your host, Austin Davidson and John Keir, talking Steelers all the time. Now, here's Austin and John. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another edition of the Stronger Than Steel podcast. John Keir here today on another solo venture of the podcast, talking about interior offensive linemen. So with the Steelers needing some offensive line help after struggling to run the ball last season, that need was only fortified with the loss of both Matt Filer in free agency and the retirement of Marquise Pouncey. So with that being an important position of need, I figured it would be appropriate to talk a little bit about uh, some possible prospects that the Steelers could be looking at ahead of the draft here. And just because a player is an interior offensive lineman, it doesn't mean that they can play both center or guard. But uh, generally, those positions tend to be more fluid than tackle to guard or center. So, with that in mind, I just wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about what the Steelers have at guard and center right now. First, they have the returning in the returning starter at right guard, David DeCastro, former All-Pro. A lot of question marks with him coming into what will be, I believe, is yes, his tenth season in the NFL. The former All-Pro had probably his worst season since his rookie year, really struggling with consistent play, not doing a good job of making holes in the ground game, and struggling a bit in pass protection, unlike the way, unlike ways that he ever has in the past. So 2021 is going to be an important year for him in terms of bouncing back from what was arguably the worst year of his career. But there is a lot of starting experience there, and I do believe that he was hurt for most of last season. So the hope is he can play better this season after a disappointing 2020 season. On the opposite side of him is expected to be standout rookie from last year, Kevin Dotson, the longtime starter at Louisiana Lafayette. Dotson was a really a road grader for the Raging Cajuns in college. Stepped in early, had to play a lot early in the season due to injuries to Stefan Wisniewski and David DeCastro and played pretty well, uh, earning some honorable mentions from Pro Football Focus for his good play during the season. Ended up being controversial when Matt Filer started over Dotson in the playoff game, but it looks like he has the inside track to starting at left guard, and it should be his position to lose. He played really well last season, and barring anything unforeseen, he should be a quality starter at left guard next season, uh, jumping from year one to year two. The big question is going to be at center, and with the loss of Pouncey and free agency, the Steelers made two signings at center. They brought back exclusive rights free agent J.C. Hassenauer, who was really just a center and is just a depth center at that. He had, I believe, one or two starts last season and was just good enough in his two starts. But Hassenauer is back as of this point to be the number two center. And right now the penciled-in starter is free former free agent signee B.J. Finney, who signed on with the team as an undrafted free agent in 2015. Spent four seasons. Oh, wait a minute, let me think about this. I take that back. It was in 2016 because he he was with the team for four seasons, then signed as a free agent with the Seattle Seahawks, was then traded to the Bengals, and they cut him. So the Steelers scooped him up. He's a solid interior depth option, but uh, also his natural position is center from college, so he is penciled in to start right now. Though in an ideal world, I imagine that he would be the backup in uh, in that ideal scenario. But for right now, he is the starting center. Behind those guys, the Steelers have, as I already mentioned, J.C. Hassenauer. They also have John Laguli, or Laglu, and Rashad Coward. Coward was signed uh, signed previously from the Bears, and I'm not 100% sure where Laglu fits in there. But those are just depth pieces at this point. Elsewhere on the line, the only other offensive lineman that has any sort of experience at guard is Joe Haig, and he did not play well there last season. So the starters appear to be in place on the offensive line, but they could upgrade at center, and they could add more depth along the interior as well. So that is a quick snapshot of the interior offensive line. And now we can get into the four players I looked at. 
and I'll talk a little bit about them, but mostly I'm going to be uh, talking about how they fit in and not so much the nuanced part of their games. Information on that can be found on our website, strongerthansteelnfl.blogspot.com. I will include a link to the blog post on this uh, on this topic so you can get a deeper dive into my thoughts on these players. Uh, so that way you, I don't have to spend a ton of time talking about it. I can just say my piece and you can look at what I've written uh, to see if you agree or not or disagree with what I thought about them. So first, I'm going to start with Creed Humphrey, the center from Oklahoma. Many are thinking he's going to be drafted possibly even early in the first round of the draft that's starting uh, pretty soon here. After originally being thought of as a day two pick, Humphrey appears to be uh, charging up the draft boards. So a longtime starter with the uh, Oklahoma Sooners. He started, I want to say, 35, 37 games. He started 37 games in college. A lot of experience and had has played a bunch of games against top-tier quality programs in the college football playoffs. His best attribute, I would have to say, are his really strong hands. He's got those types of those type of hands that where you when you latch on to the defender, he's not letting go of you. So uh, that's a big thing for him to have. He's a ferocious blocker, and uh, it was evident on tape that he's a, a natural leader. One of those guys that uh, really likes to plant guys and brings that mean streak, that physical edge to his game. And he's also got a pretty strong upper body. Tested well with the bench press at his pro day and uh, can shove guys around, can wall guys off. That was what I saw a lot of, not so much blocking down the field, but redirecting guys and turning them away from the hole. Uh, Some cons to his game, though. I felt like his lower body strength didn't match his upper body strength, Um, and his his feet tend to not follow his body, so sometimes his footwork is a little uneasy, and another negative is that against... Other NFL talent like Quinn and Williams and, oh, what was the guy's name? Bravian uh, Roy, I want to say, from Baylor. He got absolutely manhandled. And the Big 12 is not known for defense and not for exotic blitzes. They send a lot of three-man pass rush, uh, a lot of three-man rushes in the Big 12, and Creed Humphrey benefited from that. So there's there's a bit of a question as far as if he's going to be a good pass protector in the NFL. He's also not a great athlete, so expecting him to help out in space the way Marquise Pouncey used to is just simply, that's just simply a mistake. He's not going to be very good at it. My final thoughts on Humphrey are that I think he's going to be a really good player, but I don't know that he's going to be ever a top center. He's going to be a guy that can play in the league for a while. He should be able to represent a team well but he has athletic limitations and he's got to bulk up a bit in the lower half if he can do that I think he's got a legitimate shot to be a starter in the league for you know five to ten years but I don't think he'll ever be a top level center he'll be a guy that could be fighting relatively early on after his first contract uh, to be a starter but you know that's all in his hands obviously I still think he's a solid player I think anything earlier than the second round is a bit high for Creed Humphrey. And to be honest with you, I think even the second round is a bit rich for me. But knowing how the Steelers are needing a center, if the Steelers took Humphrey at 55, I would understand that. Next, I want to talk about Trey Smith, bigger guard from Tennessee. This guy was a pretty accomplished player in college, but he had some struggles With things out of his control, and I'm talking mostly about blood clots in his lungs, which is very unfortunate for him. Nearly cost him his career, but he was able to bounce back and return. But the nature of blood clots is that you don't really know when they're going to flare up if they are. And if they do, unfortunately, it could mean the end of his career. So that's going to be a huge medical red flag, and the teams are going to have to clear him themselves before they think about taking a risk on him. And that's obviously not something you want out of a guy you're going to be drafting to be a major contributor to your offense for the years to come. So right off the bat, knowing that when you're watching his tape is kind of tough to stomach just because when you watch him play, you can see why he's a highly touted guy, why he 
why he was thought of as a top of the line guy that could be a potential first rounder when he got to Tennessee. I mean, he's he's a big guy, he's powerful, he's a pretty good run blocker, and he plays with that violent edge to his game. I know that's something we talk about a lot in linemen, but it I think it's important. Uh, on the downside, though, he, he struggled with some of the more finer points, the nuanced part of his game. His footwork, the technical aspect of his footwork was really bad. I felt like there were times where his feet were like heavy. It was almost like he was carrying lead in his cleats. And it would lead to some blown pass protection reps where defenders would get around him or they'd get by him. And I know that he's big and he's long, so that can make up for it a bit. But you have to minimize your your window for error in the NFL. And Smith is having problems with that right now. And to be fair to him, he did miss a lot of time in off seasons in the past with training in regards to his blood clotting issue. So he never fully developed the way he probably should have. But at the end of the day, he still does a lot of things really well. I think he had really strong tape. He's got fast, strong hands. And like I said, didn't have the issue, didn't have the ability to develop, which became an issue for him, as we know. And he did start across three seasons, so even with those issues, he was still on the field quite a bit. And then the, the main negative, obviously, is that the medical is just a huge concern and something that you just can't ignore. Beyond that, he had inconsistent play overall. There were some times he played well. I saw, I, I want to say, his best and worst game graded by PFF against uh, South Carolina and Georgia, I believe. So I saw the best and worst with him. And he's also he's also not built to be like a center, so if he's going to be a, he's only going to be a guard, uh, barring something unforeseen. And as I mentioned before, his footwork is not too good at this point. But I I really feel like when he gets to work with an NFL coaching staff, he gets that full off season prep in. He has a chance to work in a in an NFL training program. I really think you could see some good work out of Trey Smith at the NFL level, but. That issue with the blood clots is something that has to be kept up on. And it's something that a team is going to take knowing that it could very well backfire on them. So with all that in mind, I think that's the reason that Smith's draft uh, stock has dropped. From an expected first or second rounder to a day two, late day two, early day three pick. So uh, while I think that he's got a lot of good tools... The medical concerns are very hard to ignore. Next, I have Tommy Kramer, the longtime starter for the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. A very good offensive line. They have, I want to say, three or four guys looking like they could go in the NFL draft this year. Kramer is a guy that's really built like a tackle, but due to athletic limitations, had to play guard. I mean, this is a guy that, <clears throat> he wasn't like overly powerful, but he was stronger than his peers more often than not. And it it showed pretty pretty often. But the the real issues in his athletic limitations were quite evident early on and often in his tape. Uh, when you are not a great athlete, you can tend to get stored closer to the center of the line of scrimmage because, <clears throat> because of the fact that you aren't going to be dealing with athletes that are quite as good in the middle. You know, you've got your nose tackles. You won't have to worry about edge rushers as much. You don't have to worry about depth as much. You just worry about what's in front of you more often than moving laterally. The problem with that is that I don't think he has his size. He's almost too big to play center. I wonder if he's going to be able to do that. And if you leave him at guard, you're going to you're going to do so knowing that he's probably not going to be able to help you on move blocks. He just he's not good at it. Um he just really, I mean, he hustles. I give him credit for it. But the, the further away he gets from his spot, the harder it is for him to get done what he has to do. And he's strong and he can help in line and uh, block down on guys. But I honestly just wasn't overall, overall speaking, I wasn't that impressed with what I saw from him. I liked more of what I saw from Robert Hainsey, who was to his right and someone else we talked about with uh, potential to move to center. So... The quick pros for Kramer, he started, how many games did he start? He started 39 games in college at Notre Dame, was a team captain. He's a powerful, physical offensive lineman, 
a good run blocker, and he's got pretty good size for an interior guy with the potential to move to center. But on the other hand, his footwork is terrible. He's not a good athlete, and he's probably going to struggle in pass protection. He really did struggle at times against uh, the more athletic types on the interior. And picking up athletic blitzers was a big struggle for him. I see him as a seventh-round pick, possibly an undrafted free agent. And he's just another example of the great offensive lineman in college that might struggle to translate to the NFL because it's just so much faster at that level than it is in college. I still think he's worth a look, especially as an undrafted free agent. He could be the next, uh, you know, J.C. Hassenauer, or maybe even a little bit better. But there are definitely questions to his game, and they are legitimate. Last on my list is Ben Cleveland, a massive six foot six, almost 350 pounds. Uh, wasn't a major starter until his last season here at Georgia. So you're talking about a raw prospect with massive physical, a massive physical specimen with great size and strength. Uh, strength that I felt like was underutilized in terms of his overall delivery because he's not the most technically sound lineman. Something that he's really going to need to be coached up on is, I know, and I know it's a theme here, but the footwork. This guy can't be expected to block on the move, and even when he's just blocking, uh, getting into his pass sets, he can get he, he can really struggle with uh, these squattier defensive tackles, these bull rushers, and guys that have the ability to get around guys. You can't get through him very easily but you can speed rush around him and he just doesn't move efficiently enough to be able to combat that he has long arms so it can help him but at the end of the day when you're going up against elite interior rushers especially the speed rushers and Aaron Donald would absolutely destroy this guy and uh, he's going to have work to do at the NFL level but when you're talking about the great size and strength that's a great place to start with and uh, even though his tape wasn't great to me, I can see the potential in him. And if you get some work with uh, an NFL coaching staff, he gets a little more technically sound. I think you've got a really good guard here. He's only a guard, though. No, no transitioning to center here. He's too big for it. He doesn't project well at it. So, you know. A six foot six guard at three fifty, and he's not. It's not like he's fat either. Like he is, he's a lot of muscle there. So if he can just figure out how to unlock all that potential he's got, he could be a really good guard for a while. Not a pulling guard, not a guard on the move. A real throwback, pound guys down uh, at the point of attack, uh, physically grind out defensive linemen, and uh, really make them earn the plays that they make. I see him as a fourth-round projected player, and I agree with that just simply because of how raw he is right now. There's no guarantee he'll ever be the player that I think he could be. And when you're taking guys, then you really are just looking at, can they break through the ceiling that I think that they have? So, a lot of interesting players. Uh, none of them, Austin covered Landon Dickerson, and there's obviously, uh, you've obviously got to talk about uh uh, Quinn Miners uh, from Wisconsin Whitewater. So there's a lot of interesting names there, but again, uh, these were the four guys I looked at, and I uh, again, if you, if you if you want to see my in-depth thoughts about these four players, feel free to check out the link listed in the description below. Uh, feel free to comment on it. Tell me what you think of it. Do you agree with my assessment of these guys? Do you disagree? Why? Um, this was just to be a brief snapshot of these guys in the Steelers' current offensive line room along the interior. So uh, I appreciate taking the time to listen to this. I appreciate the feedback. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, I'll be back next time talking about uh, edge rushers. Until then, thank you for listening to the Stronger Than Steel podcast. You have been listening to Stronger Than Steel Podcast. Thank you for joining us today, and don't forget to check out our website listed in the description below.